Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Brian Rappersad, and today I will be talking about the Samsung Galaxy Note 10. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO74. Well, welcome back to another episode of me, Ryan, talking to you about a Samsung phone. How many times have I done this now? Let's find out. The Samsung Galaxy S8, the S9, the Note 9, 10, and now, finally, the Note 10. That's a lot of Galaxy phones. It's amazing how long I've been doing this. Now, have I purchased other phones in the... In, you know, in between time, yes, I did purchase a phone from my mom. It was one of the Pixel phones, the Pixel 3a. Have I purchased any iPhones? No, because they're not good enough yet, but they will be one day. Have I purchased any other brand name phones? No, not really. It has been Samsung since the Nexus line has ended years and years and years ago. Now, that's because it turns out that as soon as the S8 came out years ago, the line got good. It turns out that Samsung realized that nobody liked TouchWiz. Nobody really liked the Samsung experience either, but it was better. And it turns out that Samsung would routinely put all of the major visual and functionality features of the next year's Android update into their experience, their their theme or their launcher or their whatever. They would just put it in there a year ahead of time. So it's been a long time since I've had a stock Android phone, and to be honest, I am very okay not having a stock Android phone anymore as a regular part of my phone arsenal. It's fine. It doesn't matter anymore. It's totally just okay. So I'm going to talk about today the Galaxy Note 10 Plus and how it's a little bit different and mostly just a lot of the same from the S10 earlier this year. Now, for, you know, the, the the fans out there, you should listen to the Nexus.tv slash SO61 right before you finish listening to this episode. So you pause now and go listen to it and then come back and then listen to all the things that I say that are exactly the same. Because if you like the S10 line, you will also like the Note line, except maybe one thing, which is, of course, the size. But otherwise, the phones are identical. And we'll talk more about that later as we continue. So before we talk about pricing of the Galaxy Note 10, we have to talk about pre-ordering and how that process changed year over year and phone over phone. So in the old days, you could order your phone from either Samsung or Best Buy. I preferred to actually order from Best Buy because, well, I actually like to shop local. It helps everybody out. But this year, Best Buy changed their pre-ordering process. So this time... You actually had to do kind of a weird step thing. You had to show them your phone twice, basically. First, when you were making the pre-order, and then when you were fulfilling the pre-order, they would examine your phone. Although later reports said that that wasn't true, and they just made that up on the spot when you asked them. Then, actually, when you did the pre-order and you were about to pay for your new phone, your new Note 10, instead of giving you a gift card that you could use immediately, they prohibited you from using it immediately. That is a big bummer. So it's a $1,100 for the Note 10 Plus. You could not trade in your Note 9 for $600 and immediately use that $600 on the cost of the new phone. You were prohibited from doing so. That's a pretty big turnoff for me, and I said no to that because that's kind of my whole model of flipping the phones, You're, you know, model after model. So I flip notes to other notes, and I flip, Uh, s lines to other s lines it's a good pattern it's very reliable for some reason best buy changed how that worked this year and it was kind of a bummer now there's one more story about pre-ordering that we have to cover before we talk about the phone that is how to send the trade-in phone to samsung so this year i ordered on samsung's website samsung.com very easy to do you can either order it from the app or from the website i chose the website i like computers now With the website, what you do is you buy your phone, and then when you get it, they send you a shipping label and a pack-in receipt, and then you box up your phone in the same box that they sent you your new phone in. Very simple, very easy process. Except if you read the Samsung subreddit, 
where they tell you all of the horror stories of how they sent in an iPhone and instead of being, uh, you know, totally wiped and completely unlocked, it turns out somebody swapped the models in transit and it was totally locked or the phone was sent in in pristine condition, but then by the time it got there, it had bounced around so much it was shattered into a billion bits. That is not my experience. So what I did is I packed my phone very thoroughly. Uh, I used the original Note 9 as my trade-in phone, and I used its original box and put the phone in the box, packed it all up, taped the edges so that somebody would have to cut the tape again. I put two pack-in receipts into the box, one on top of the packing foam and stuff that I put in, and one on the bottom so that no matter which side they open the box in, they would immediately see the thing to scan. Very important to do. I put the physical shipping label on the outside of the box, and I crossed out all of the markings for any other things that came on the box beforehand. And I taped over that label so that nothing could tamper with it in transit. And I used really nice uh, tamper-proof tape. It's that tape that has lines in it, so that if somebody tries to rip that tape off and then make it look like it hadn't been opened before, you can very clearly tell that the tape was tampered with. I really like this tape. It costs a little bit more at Target, but it's actually really useful to have. And I recorded the entire process. So the entire process uh, was recorded on my other phone because I have a lot of phones. And what's really cool about that is I took all of those and I immediately uploaded those to Google in, in, uh, in Google Photos. And I made very clear timestamps of them. So the entire process was kept controlled and very orderly now i got the phone uh in launch week a couple of days before general availability and then i sent it out i sent out the trade in a few days later and everything worked out just fine eventually they were able to receive the phone and everything worked out you were required to drop off your trade in phone inbox in person at a fedex store which is very nice for assurance that a person actually had responsibility for it the other important thing to ask for if you ever do this is ask for a tracking code immediately upon handing your phone over i signed up to the fedex tracking code update thing where it sends you text messages as it goes through and i heard many people say that they didn't get a tracking number from fedex which is a bummer which means they didn't know that samsung received their phone until samsung admitted it and uh, allegedly they are not trustworthy so having FedEx was very good for for assurance that the phone actually got to where it was supposed to go. Because then you could see that it's in Minnesota, it's in Illinois, it's in North Carolina, and now it's in Texas, and that's where it belongs. So getting all of the pre-order stuff out of the way, you know, it took a little bit longer, you know, it was a little bit more involved. You know, I can just walk into a Best Buy, bring my phone in a sealed Ziploc bag, they can open it up, check its IMEI, it's no big deal. But having to do all of that work myself all the recording all the boxing up i made i made very thoroughly sure that it would arrive safely um a little bit more work now was it worth it yes to actually reduce my out-of-pocket cost by six hundred dollars yes totally worth it pre-order uh trade in at six hundred dollars and getting that price taking out of the phone price immediately 100 percent worth it Unless it goes bad, and then it wouldn't be worth it anymore. Okay, anyway, so let's let's get back to actually talking about the phone and all of the things that are important about it. There are two models this time. There are two models, and that means one of the models is better. So the first model is the Note 10. The second model is the Note 10 Plus. Now what that means is there's one that's expensive and one that's even more expensive. Now, it's pretty clear that Samsung understands how expensive the phones are. The S10 lineup was 750 900 and 1000 This lineup on the Note side is 1000 and 1100 It totally adds up that, that that is the case. There is sort of an interesting thing, though, that, that pricing umbrella is weird because there's an overlap. And what I think that means is that in the future, the lines will eventually get merged. There will be one line and the the prices will just have to get adjusted to compensate for that. Now, I purchased the Note 10 Plus, so I won't be able to tell you much about the regular Note 10. It's not as good 
the screen's a little bit worse. Um, there's a few less sensors on the back with the camera module. Uh, battery is significantly smaller. But I'll tell you one nice thing. This year, for the Note line, black was actually an option at launch. Uh, the other cool thing at launch for the for the color set was uh, Aura Glow, I believe. And it looks really cool. It's kind of like one of those holographic cards that you probably have seen, you know, back in the good old days of holographic things. And it's, it just looks really cool. Like, it, it has all of the colors, but it's sort of this silver white. But when you look at it in light, it's just all of the colors all of the time. Really cool. I like it a lot. So let's talk about the display of the Note 10 Plus. Wow, is it big. 6.8 inches. Can you believe that? 6.8 inches with a ratio of 19 to 9, which is just ever so slightly different slash better than 18.5 to 9. Works out fine. Not a big deal. Uh, it's using Gorilla Glass 6, and that is not remarkable anymore. It used to be a big deal. Uh, the special features from the S10 line are all here. Fingerprint sensor in the screen, ambient display, you name it. There's a new placement, though, for the front camera. So the, the S10, of course, um, the big S10, had a double-wide cutout because there were two cameras and only one of them did anything because Samsung thought that would be cool, I guess, to justify the price difference, I think, maybe. I'm not sure. So instead of having two modules, it's just down to one module on the front. And instead of being in the corner, it's now in the center. And I believe they're calling this the Infinity O design. Very nice name. And it's just pixels from the top of the phone. Looks very nice. Now, the display itself is uh, basically symmetrical around the whole phone. I think the bottom chin is ever so slightly bigger than the top forehead. Uh, there is still bezel. Like, it is not fully screen everywhere, but it's pretty close. And in any decent app with an ambient or with a with a uh, AMOLED theme, uh, the the edges blend right into the to the, to the actual bezel edges of the phone. So that's really nice. I'm a big fan of that. Now, one interesting thing is, I believe on previous generations, even with the S10 line, the glass was slightly notched on the top so that there could be hmm, notched. That's a funny thing to say, because we all make fun of that. Uh, it was ever so slightly notched on the top so that there would be room for a physical speaker, uh, but facing you. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. The The actual speaker's on the top bezel side, facing basically up if you were holding your phone to your ear. And it's kind of weird. Like, you can still hear everything just fine, um, but the traditional speaker grill is now absent. I don't think that's a big deal. It actually makes the whole front of the face look much cleaner and smoother and overall better looking. Let's talk about some of the physical aspects of the phone now. You know, it's uh, pretty big. So, you know, everybody likes to hear about how big these phones are. So it is 162 by 77 by 7.9 millimeters. Now, it's a little bit bigger than your S10 Plus. It's significantly bigger than your S10 regular. And it's not vastly bigger than your Note 9. Now, what is interesting is the weight. So I thought this was going to be uh, a really big and heavy phone. It's actually a little bit lighter than the Note 9, but ever so slightly heavier than the S10. So, you know, pros and cons. So it's physically bigger, but it's a little bit lighter than the previous generation, which was smaller from its same line, but a little bit bigger and heavier than its parent line. So, you know, it just depends on what you're looking for there. Um, as far as, as far as it goes, my hands are very sensitive to, to phone size and weight. For long extended sessions, like the phone can just get heavy, but if you're, ever using it for a long time stop that and go use a computer but it's actually not a big deal like its phone size is fine uh and i would have to say like 
I look at my phone frequently and, you know, it just, it's fun to look at because it's, it looks so cool. It's pretty much the, the definition of a modern good looking phone, I would say. Like, there's no notch. There's a camera, but you need a camera there. There's nothing weird going on on the screen. There's no, like, two screens, two panels. It's just a normal phone. It's just good. So I'm, I'm very pleased with that. Comparing to the Note 9, wow, it sure does look ancient. The Note 9 just looks so old. It has what looks visually like a centimeter of space on the top and bottom of the screen. It doesn't. It's a, it's It's not as bad as that. But it is so old looking compared to this. This is so refreshing. Uh, the S10, of course, looks basically identical to this, but the differences are the curves and even the uh, top and bottom bezels of the S10 are a little bit thicker, but the curves of the S10 are much more rounded. Uh, the Note is historically very boxy, uh, whereas the S line is very curved. This looks better to me, the, the boxiness and the shallow uh, screen curves on the side. Whereas the S10 can look a little, little old in comparison, but again, it it's all relative. So like, if this didn't exist, you would say the S10 looks just fine. As all phones tend to do these days, they have what are known as antenna bands. So since the iPhones back in the good old days, probably since the iPhone 4 back in the good old days of Antenna Gate, all phones come with a metal rim for the most part. And what is a you a common feature shared across phones uh in the modern time are these phones have these little plastic separators along that metal band that wraps around the phone. So usually each segment that is divided out by these small plastic bands, each one of those segments is an antenna. Those are really cool because that way you can get 4G and 3G and 5G and all of the G's that you could ever want. But there's something to say about seeing those bands. Now, I have a case on my phone. I have a case on pretty much every phone that I have. But what's interesting is the bands, particularly on this Note phone, along the top, not on the side, they wrap around the bezel. So you can actually see a small bit of band appearing towards you when you look at the top of the phone. And the band is not centered directly above the camera punch out, which means you always think that there's a strange little piece of dirt right to the left of your camera punch. It's not, it's not great. It's not a good look. Uh, so I often wonder, is that lint? Do I need to wipe that away? Is that sand? What is that? Oh, it's just the band. It's not a big deal, but it's just annoying that it's not symmetric. If it had been in the center or if there had been another one on the opposing side, on the right-hand side of the camera punch-out, it would have been fine. The battery of the S10 Plus was 4,200 milliamp hours, whereas the battery of the Note 10 Plus is 4,300 milliamp hours, which means it's basically the same for my usage, even though the screen is gigantic. 6.8 inches, everybody. Whew, it is big. Now, Samsung is doing something a little screwy with the battery this year. So in the past, when I got the Note 9 and S9, that section of phones, I thought they were over-provisioning their battery just a little bit so that they could say for longer that it was running at the rated capacity so if it said that it was a 4,000 battery, it could be 4,000 for, you know, nine months instead of dropping to 3,800. So what I've heard is the battery rating for the Note 10 line is that they are saying that 4,300 is an average and yet your phone might come with less or more. Now, I don't know why it would ever come with more. I think it only could ever come with less, but that's kind of a bummer. Now, I used to run something called AccuBattery. I no longer do that because according to all of the Samsung people, it is inaccurate and basically a lie. And so also, why do I want something running on my phone, tracking my battery usage? It's just another thing, wasting my battery. Not a big deal. Battery is fine for me. I'm getting a full day 
I'm usually coming home around 45%, uh, and that's with two Google Maps sessions, about 30 to 40 minutes each, um, using it throughout the day. I'm actually using it in a very low signal reception area, which is, I believe, the single and number one cause of battery drain. Totally okay. Not no, Nothing special there. I would love to have a bigger battery. Still, like, why not? Like, give me a give me a six thousand milliamp hour battery, uh, and make make the phone eight point two uh, millimeters thick, and make it uh, a a square two hundred grams. But I I can understand why that's not the case. Charging on this phone uh, was really hyped up, and it shouldn't have been. I don't understand the the media these days. The, there's a new 45 watt charger that Samsung is making available with this phone. It doesn't come with it. Um, totally fine. In fact, I don't even use the charger that the phone came with. Uh, I'm always a few chargers behind because, you know, I bought all these phones, right? I'm pretty sure I'm using the Note 9 charger still and it works fine. It charges up in a, in a, in a seemingly in crazy amount of time. When I charge in the car, even with the little wimpy, um, you know, car charger that I bought from Anchor 10 years ago. Okay, fine. Five years ago. Totally charges just fine. So I don't really know if anybody needs the 45 watt charger. It charges very fast. It has wireless charging if you need it to charge wirelessly. I don't like wireless charging because what I do is I take my phone, uh, leave it at my desk at work, and then I grab it and then I put it down and then I grab it and put it down as I come and go through the day. I just don't charge at work. It's just too much. Too much charging for me. Let's talk about ports. Hey, did you hear that this phone doesn't have a headphone jack? Ugh, there wasn't a day on the Android subreddit when the headphone jack wasn't lamented. And, uh, I don't mind. I don't use headphones very often. When I do, I will pair these with my Sony noise canceling headphones. When I don't pair with those, I will use my work headphones, which are Bluetooth. Or if I don't pair with those and I'm going on a dog walk and I need something a little bit lighter, I will use my previously gifted to me from Samsung uh, Galaxy Buds. Also fine. Basically, you don't need plug and play headphones anymore. Now, that being said, I've recently been looking at mics, uh, lapel mics in particular, for a phone. Now, it's very difficult to find a lapel mic that has USB natively, because why would you have that? So, there there can be situations where this phone that's supposed to be for professionals or pro usage doesn't have a obvious thing. It's kind of weird. Why does this phone, the pro one, not have the headphone jack, but the consumer version, the S10 line, have a headphone jack? I think what will be interesting is when the S11 line comes out in March of 2020, let's look to see if the the port situation either changes or doesn't. I would expect those phones not to have the headphone jack. But on the other hand, this doesn't make any sense. So I guess we'll find out. Otherwise, Type-C has been great. Uh, You know, the Type-C port down here at the bottom of the phone works just fine. Now, what's interesting about the uh, Type-C port is it also powers all of the capabilities with DeX. So you can use DeX by plugging in your phone to whatever you want, any any kind of computer, whether it be a Windows computer now or maybe a Mac, although I'm not quite sure, uh, but Windows for sure. And you can plug it into uh, an HDMI monitor. So, you know, you can use a Type-C to HDMI cable, and then you can just DeX on that computer um, using the phone as a remote slash keyboard as it needs to be. Really cool. Port enables that. Speakers, well, they're okay. I've seen a lot of criticism from the speakers. So as I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the screen, the speakers aren't in the traditional spot, at least not the top front-facing speaker, because it's not front-facing anymore. It used to be in a cutout, along the top of the screen. Now, 
It's physically at the top of the phone facing up if you're holding your phone in a normal position. What that means is your sound hearing reception goes down because it's not going directly into your ear on a call. But it's also kind of nice because if you set your phone down and you just want to play back some audio, whether that be a podcast or a speaker call, you actually hear whatever the sound is being bounced back at you. And how often are you in an actual room or that you actually have something in front of you? Usually pretty often. So in some ways it's fine. In other ways, it's not as good. I think the volume is fine. I think it's all fine. I don't have a problem with them. Other people have had a lot of criticism of the speakers. I don't see the criticism. They could be better, but they're not bad. They're fine. Now, the mics are really cool. There's uh, approximately three mics. So there's a mic on the top, a mic on the bottom. And then, according to uh, image breakdowns, there's a mic on the back. Now, my case actually covers the mic on the back. But it's a mic that is ever so slightly tucked away in, <laughs> in another bezel, in the bezel of the camera module bump. Now, I have no way to verify if that's true because I don't see it, but that's what I've heard. It sounds really cool if that is the case. The buttons on this phone have made an amazing change year over year. So in the old days, you might have heard everybody complaining about the Bixby button. So the button layout used to be on the left side of the phone, volume rockers up, down. Then below that, just a little bit, would be the Bixby button. And then on the right side, you'd have the power, you know, sleep-wake button, as we all do. This phone, the Note 10, decides to go away from that pattern. And instead, you no longer have a power button. Now you only have a Bixby button on the left side and volume rockers right above it. That's right. You heard me. No power button. Only a Bixby button. Now, for anybody else, for, for if if Samsung hadn't made the change that I'll tell you right about in just a moment, if they hadn't made this change, everybody would have written this phone off as, eh, okay, that's cool. We're not going to use that. This change redeemed it. I mean, it's really a gate change. So, like, if the change had been made, but then hadn't been also expanded on, like, this would have been a problem. Okay, here's the deal. You can change the button's behavior built into the phone now, so you no longer need a third-party app, which means you can change the left button from Bixby to just sleep-wake and power. And you can go a step further. You can also built in, by default, set whether you want one tap to uh do that, or two taps, and then you can set the other as another different action. So I have mine set up to be sleep, sleep, wake, power. And then for a long press tap or a double tap, I guess you can do uh launch right into the camera mode as you always have been able to do with a power button. Now it comes predefined with Bixby and I don't understand like Samsung, you're pushing Bixby, but you made the option to, for me to get, basically get rid of it. Clearly you don't care about it. Because you took away the button that could have always hosted it and I would have just ignored your physical button. So, like, the messaging is really weird. Like, this is a pro phone. All the pros are going to get rid of Bixby. So that means you don't care about it. But you care enough about it to have it, have it had a button everywhere else, but not on the phone that's for the pros. The messaging doesn't make a lot of sense. But, wow, what a difference does that make? So in the first week of having this phone, I was still using the uh, S10 because... You know, I just didn't have time to set it up on the first night. It turns out that I got used to the left-handed position of the button so fast. And I kept going back to the S10 to wake it up as I was copying things over. I kept trying to hit the button and I kept opening Bixby and I just like, what is going on? It is really weird to learn over three to four generations of button placement and to have to unlearn it. But it was a very easy transition. Uh, many people hated the change. I was okay with it. But wow, what a what a cool thing that Samsung did to make the change okay. So I know what you've been waiting for. 
you've been waiting for me to talk about the S Pen. The S Pen is back. This is a note phone. This is what makes it a note you can write on your phone. That's right. You can pop your pen out and immediately, even if you're on the, you know, ambient display mode screen, you can just start doodling on your phone. It will just launch right into that functionality. It's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. I never use this thing. <laughs> now, I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you the story. I am often in meetings at work. What people do these days, you go to meetings and you never get out. Uh, I was sitting in a meeting and I had no paper with me. And I thought, wow, this is really good insight. I should write this down. I had nothing to write it down on. I reached down. I tried to pull out my S Pen. And I have a Galaxy S10+. Plus. There was no S Pen. I couldn't write down anything like a normal person. So in the first few months of having the S10, I really did miss the 9's pen. But, you know, to be honest, a pen serves almost no purpose. Like, you never really write anything on a phone. It's uh, I've used it to draw little diagrams. You know, if we don't have a whiteboard handy, I'll draw some stuff. Um, I don't really know why the pen is so cool for some people. Like, I don't know what they do with it. There are no apps that make use of the S Pen outside of the Samsung apps because who's going to program a Samsung Note Pen app only? That would be kind of a waste of time and money. So I don't really know. I like it for its use occasionally, but it really has no no it, it really has no bearing on whether I should buy a phone or not, to be honest. Now the pen itself, it did change year over year, so let's talk about that. So last year, when the Note 9 came out, the gimmick was you would buy a blue phone and then you would get this neon electric yellow pen with it. And it looked ridiculous. Now, in Samsung's infinite wisdom, they said, no, let's not do that ever again. Now they just give you a black pen with your black phone. Ugh, finally. What that means is the pen is all black. I don't know if it got bigger or smaller because I don't have the previous pen to compare anymore. But the pen, instead of being two pieces of plastic joined together, so there was kind of like a top half and a bottom half, and there was kind of a seam, this is now one piece of plastic. There's the tip, of course. There's the press button. It's fun to press the button. And that's it. Like, that is the physical entirety of the pen. Now, it still would seem cool if that top button was actually a real button that you could program something into when the pen was out of the phone i think that'd be neat but there is still a button that's a real button on the phone and its purpose is uh to basically let you do selections when you're in pen mode so if you are hovering over something and you you, you want to basically accept and say yes to something you can certainly do so by hitting the little button not a big deal but what is a big deal is Kind of, what else can you do with the pen? So there's a new mode called Air Actions. And, you know, it's kind of a wasted opportunity, to be honest. Air Actions allegedly will let you do little gestures in the air while holding the button to go and do something in the app you're in. So, for example, anytime if you have a single press, you can pause play your music or double press play the next track you can do if you hold up you can swipe up if you hold down you can swipe or you can volume down and so on the one action that's not here that needs to be here the one thing that samsung kind of really missed out on is making scrolling a universal air action but that, what i mean is let's say you're in the twitter app and you want to scroll up and down your timeline and you just want to put your phone you know against uh you know the table, you know, prop it up at something and just scroll by flicking up and down. That would be super cool. But Samsung didn't make that. That's not one of the built-in actions. Actions have to be coded in per app, and that's just never going to happen. Now, the one action that is useful is the remote camera taking action. You can press the button in camera mode and it will either start recording a video taking a photo, whatever mode you're currently in. And that's pretty cool. I'm a pretty big fan of that. There is a, a way on the pen to also to change your mode. Let's see. Uh, do I remember how to do that? Nope, I, I sure don't. 
but the air actions and the camera do work. It's clear that air actions um really evolved from the camera, and since they control the camera, that's how that works. Now, there is one more thing about the pen that I can tell you about that's kind of new for this year. So, uh, as I mentioned in the opening of the pen section, if you take your pen out and you start immediately writing on the ambient display screen, that's really cool. You can do that. But where do those notes go? So they go into the notes app. So you can open the notes app and now you can see all the notes that you've ever made. And it's pretty fun. But what you couldn't do before is really like couldn't search for your notes because they were all handwritten. Well, Samsung has the solution. They've built in some machine learning stuff or just handwriting recognition. Ooh, machine learning to uh, basically make an, a, a basic index, at least for your handwritten notes. So I have a note here that says big week. Of course I do. And if I type in BI, it immediately shows me the big week note. If I go back to my main screen here, I, uh, let's see. Um, I've got the, I've got the word dude on one of these notes. If I, if I type in the word dude, it immediately DU, it shows me the note with dude on it. It's actually really good for recognizing singular words. I don't think you'd have good luck recognizing a sentence. And it also depends on how good your handwriting actually comes out through the pen to the note. But wow, that's actually really cool. That's actually a useful feature. I just wish the air action supported scrolling because that would sell the pen 100 times better than any of these other gimmicky features. You know, it's kind of a bummer because the the pen itself is a nice uh, kind of like little piece of plastic. And it's cool that it hangs out inside of the note when you're not using it. But it doesn't do enough. Like, there needs to be something more you could do with it. And I, I don't know what that would be. I don't like writing on screens. I don't actually understand how that's even possible. Like, how do you even do that? Like, paper is pretty good. But uh, it's cool, but it's just not useful. Another thing that I wanted to mention was the fingerprint sensor. So this phone has a fingerprint sensor again, and it is in the screen again. Now, I thought uh, six months later that Samsung would improve, uh, maybe not significantly, but somewhat, a moderate increase in performance and precision, the fingerprint sensor capabilities. That did not seem to happen. In the S10, I had, I would say, six out of ten. It was very inconsistent. Today, with the Note 10, I can still say it's the same. So whether it is something to do with not knowing where the exact placement needs to go to uh, you know, hit the sensor, or how hard you need to depress, or how long do you need to wait, it's just not fast enough and it's just not consistent enough in all of the different ways that you can press on a screen. Uh you know, with your thumb or index finger or whatever you might use. Now, one remarkable improvement with the fingerprint sensor did occur, and that is in ambient display mode, when the phone is just hanging out, sitting on the table, you can actually see where to put your thumb because there's a little fingerprint outline on the screen, even in ambient display mode. The S10 line did not have that. This is an amazing improvement because now you know how to wake up your phone in the appropriate way. An alternative solution could have been provided back then. You could have just had a small circle or a small square, and it could have moved over time to prevent burn-in. I think Samsung is taking the uh, more pragmatic approach here. Burn-in is inevitable on an AMOLED panel, but actually having a good time using your phone, well, you should encourage that if possible. You know, everybody likes to talk about the cameras on these phones. I suppose we should, too. So it has the same camera setup as the S10+. Plus. Uh, after a year with a wide lens on a phone, so an ultra-wide, you know, 0.5 or half X zoom, I don't think I can go back to a phone without that. I think it is the singular most important camera mode now. 
because it lets you take in so much more screen space. Screen space? Is that what I see? Real reality space? I don't know. It lets you see so much more in a photo. Now that being said, in my opinion, the 2x camera mode, uh, that's the 2x uh, non, like non-digital zoom. It's the 2x real optical zoom. In my opinion, it's kind of lousy, kind of lackluster. Like you can do it. It's cool. But you don't get remarkably closer to anything. It's just not that useful. Now, what I would suggest instead is if the S11 line comes along and says, well, here, you can have your 1x mode, the normal kind of regular mode. You can have a 4x module and the current half x wide module. I think that would be enough mix to be useful. So you can have super wide shots. You can have super zoom shots and regular shots. I would also say that the uh, megapixel lineup here is kind of kind of stale. I think we've had 12 megapixel sensors for years now. The wide module is 16 megapixels, but I don't I don't think that matters because the wide angle uh, loses quality by just being wide. Basically, there's also a, an additional setting for some fisheye correction because the wide mode is so wide. There's also a time of f- flight sensor on the back of the phone for some reason what that reason is i don't know because it's never been used for anything special modes in the camera app have improved so we have some new modes now and i have some of them turned off but i also have some of them turned on so we have a new night mode and unlike in the pixel which is sort of you know go go to it and hope something good happens uh or on the new iPhones, which are, you know, here, it just turns on automatically. It It's it's um, just another mode, so it's nothing special. I don't really ever take night photos. Why are you outside taking pictures in the dark? Stop that. Go go inside and use the light. Like, it's not hard. I don't, I don't know. I never use this mode. I have it. And I'll tell you a story, though. The S10 also was supposed to receive this mode. And it did, but not until I got this phone. And the reason is I bought an unlocked S10 Plus, which means every carrier's variant had to get approved before mine could. That means I never got it. It's great. So aside from night mode, what else do we do? Uh, Well, we have everybody's favorite panorama, live focus. We have live focus video now, which I believe is new this year. We have super slow-mo, which is just slow-mo, but more mo uh nothing too exciting there on the camera side of things uh as far as modes go but we have other things too we have 4k 60 video recording um we also have something called um super steady or steady cam or something like that basically it it takes you know your full frame crops it down a little bit stabilizes everything up a little bit better it's actually really cool in combination with a gimbal if you have one of those pretty fun the other thing that I've noticed uh, phone over phone is the S10 Plus had an issue where if you're taking a video and you hit the shutter button to capture a picture, a photo of the video during that, you know, whenever you hit the button, the video would drop frames. So if you play back the video, you'll get all your pictures, but you'll also see whenever those pictures are taken because there'd be a slight frame drop, a slight jump. And that was always a bummer to me. So I would always try to take a few pictures in normal picture mode then jump to video, but not taking any new pictures. That was always a bummer. Now this phone doesn't seem to have that problem, which is which is good. Oh, and one more final, final thing. Pro mode, still here, still great. You can change all of the things. You can do all the manual stuff you've ever wanted. So that's good. Uh, the final notable feature of the camera section is before there was something called Bixby Vision, that's still around. I haven't had to actually use it at all. It's still unconfigured on my phone. The reason it is unconfigured on my phone is now QR code support is built into the camera app directly. So if you hover over a QR code and it's big enough and recognizable as a QR code, the camera app will immediately surface to you. You no longer have to jump into another deeper mode to scan a QR code. Now, as a professional person, 
developing applications and products with QR codes all over them. That's a big deal to me. That might not matter to you, but I think it's cool. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about f physical appearance and physical properties, and we've talked about the camera and some of the other gimmicks like the pen. Let's talk about specs, because everybody likes specs. Uh, You know, it's kind of the same, to be honest. It's a Snapdragon 855. It's not interesting or new or anything. You know, in the old days, you know, Samsung... uh. Uh, would work with Qualcomm and they would get lucky and be able to produce kind of like an A and B variant of a, of a chip. So like, here's the winter chip and here's the fall chip and here's a small boost and here you go. Have fun with that. You don't get that anymore. Kind of. So the S10 line obviously has a smaller uh, physical footprint, which means heat is a little bit harder to manage. In the Note line, traditionally, you have a better thermal capacity through either heat pipes or just more surface area, whatever the case might be, so they can clock the processors up just a little bit more. In terms of actual performance, as mentioned, there is no difference between the two models. They're totally fine. Now, what is better on the Note 10 Plus is the RAM. Wow, and there's a lot of it. 12 gigabytes of RAM. I, I let me tell you, like the computer that I'm recording this on has a lot more RAM than that, but the server computer that I have has only eight gigs of RAM. My old MacBook Air that I took to college only had four gigs of RAM. This has twelve gigs of RAM in it. It's like a real computer that you could buy and use for a real thing. That's amazing. Um, I've actually gone into the uh phone, you know, RAM display to see what's going on down there. And it's actually kind of a cool thing to look at it on occasion. So you can see in the RAM section, and you know, this is just an average Sunday night RAM usage. I have 7.2 gigabytes of system and apps. So that's not great. Uh, you know, it's a pretty hefty chunk. I have available 4 gigs of RAM, and I have 841 megs reserved it doesn't say what reserved means in this context but that's really cool so i think it's really fun to have 12 gigs of ram i think the smaller note has less ram though so don't don't buy that one wow 12 gigs man 12 gigs so if the ram wasn't good enough with the note 10 plus you also get 256 gigs of storage and that's no big deal uh, and I also added my own 64 gigabyte SD card for all the photos and stuff. Clearly, I don't need to do that anymore. 256 gigs is never going to be consumed unless you were taking 4K 60 video constantly. But otherwise, you're fine. Now, I'll say about that storage. Uh, I never used to be one of those people who um would download a bunch of stuff to their phone. But now, because I have so much storage and I know that I do. Whenever I download a podcast or an audiobook, I also I used to always like clean up after myself. I would say, "Okay, get all get all these old podcast episodes out of here," or "Don't pre-download all of these audiobook sections because like I don't want to be low on space." Now that that would really suck. Now I can just say, "Oh, look, I downloaded a forty-hour book." Well, yeah, sure, just download all forty hours up front. No big deal. Just do it. Just give them all up. Just go do it. On the old days, I never used to be like that. We'll talk a little bit about the software. I'll tell you what, the software is identical to how the software was on the S10 line. Exactly how I opened this entire podcast with the S8 started everything good about Samsung software. I still believe that's true. TouchWiz is gone. The Samsung experience is gone. It's now the One UI, and it sure does look just fine. One UI lets you skin it, theme it, what do whatever you want. If you want to have an AMOLED theme for everything, which I find kind of unpleasant, to be honest, 
that's fine. You can do that. You can make everything be as black as the screen will let you. That's fine. Now, I don't like that. I use the default screen. I use the default everything in terms of One UI, except the launcher. Uh, I use Action Launcher, and I haven't customized the way I like it. I have all of the default apps on the screens and all the positions that I like. I use the secret sidebar. I use the list view instead of the all apps view. It's all very nice and organized for my particular usage, but I don't have it customized the way that Chris Lacey would have it. I would say get your pixel launcher nonsense out of here. I don't want it. I don't like it. I don't have a Google search bar on my phone anywhere. Don't like it. I don't, I don't use Google now. I don't do any of that. So in terms of software, from the OS side of things, One UI has a ton of features that are really fun. So, you know, you have all of your normal things. You also have some new features this year. So you have a QR code um, shortcut in your nav bar if you want it. Um, You can link up to Windows if you want it. You have wireless power sharing because that's a thing from the S10 that you get here as well. Um, You can have your blue light filter buttons turned on. Uh, Let's see, what else can you do? Um, You can have a built, you have a built-in screen recorder now. You have uh, edge lighting if you really want it. Um, that's so that when different notifications come in, different colors can appear around the edges of the phone. There is no LED notification anymore, but why do you need that? You have the ambient display, which is always there. And with edge lighting, it can just show you visually what came in. Uh, you have uh, S Pen uh, notifications. You can turn night mode on to force it basically into a kind of a low powered orange state uh if you really wanted to and you don't you have bixby routines which is basically google actions which is basically not useful you know all that stuff all very nice software is good i i i still hear people today complaining about stock android not being present on this samsung phone and all of the samsung phones all i can say is have you used this like just give up on stock for a little while and try this you will find that everything is fine and basically identical and sometimes almost even better. The layout is fine. The look and feel might be a little weird in some cases, like the settings app. The only place you really interact with Samsung apps is a list, I would say. It looks fine. So Samsung has fine software. Now, we are running Android 9.0. And we will probably be running 9.0 until March, when the S11 comes out. This is not Samsung's fault, entirely. They they allowed this to happen, but allegedly it's the carriers that um, cause this trouble. Samsung has to wait to send updates to the unlocked models until all of the carriers have validated that their versions of the firmware and software work on their networks. I would prefer to see a time and place in the world where the software on the phone works on all the networks just fine, and we can know that ahead of time by having real people test it because all of that software is open source. Oh, but that's blasphemy. Okay, anyway. um, Totally fine. Hopefully Samsung figures out how to fix that someday. Now, uh, I will say that some people also don't like the animation speed of one UI by default. Some people find it too slow. I don't find it that way. I think it's fine. Not a big deal to me. Uh, You can, of course, turn the animation speed up in the developer settings. No problem. So here are my final thoughts for the Note 10 Plus. This is a great phone. I really enjoyed using it for the past couple of months. You know, I've had a lot of phones over the past few years from Samsung. I've had the S8, the S9, the Note 9, the S10, and now the Note 10. All of these phones have something in common. They're all from Samsung, but they've all been progressively better. In some ways, I think the S9 was the best phone prior to having the S10. I didn't really like the Note 9 so much, but I realized 
after I had the stylus for months, I used it occasionally. Once I didn't have it, I felt like I was missing out on something. Which is kind of funny because, you know, it's kind of a gimmicky feature. So, the Note 10 solves that. The Note 10 has a stylus, it's big, it's pretty fast, it has all the cameras you could ever want, and I think it has a good user interface through the operating system and theme that it has. It's not TouchWiz. The S10, though, is still a great phone. It's cheaper than it used to be. You can probably get it on sale for $850 or so. The S10 Plus is big, smaller than the Note 10 Plus, but still big. Same chip, a little bit less memory, but enough to get you by for pretty much any situation. The S11 is coming out in just five months or so. We'll start hearing rumors about how it'll look and what it'll do differently and how it'll be amazing probably at the end of January. I don't know if you've heard about this, but that's coming up here pretty soon. So, should you buy this phone? Maybe, if you want a stylus and you love notes, go for it. But if you're just looking for a regular Samsung phone, save some money and buy an S10. Or, if you have a few months to wait, buy an S11. Well, thank you for listening to the Galaxy Note 10 Plus review. Where can you find me on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RyanMR. And of course, on my website, RyanRampersad.com. You can find this episode of Second Opinion at the nexus.tv slash SO74. You can leave us comments at our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv and of course you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash the nexus tv have a good one the nexus the nexus the nexus tv podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence, convergence.